today we will uh, be uh, talking with uh, Jiyin Gyorme, who's uh, done the whole Acharya journey in the traditional way, which is a very uh, intense uh, years of studies uh, in the area of Buddhist texts. And he's also right now the uh, resident monk at the Montreal uh, Rigpe Dorji Institute teaching to Westerners. So he, have a good, he has a good sense of Western <laughs> ways of thinking and embodying the traditional way of presenting the Dharma. So it's very precious to have him along. And we have Anne with us, who is kind of the name of <laughs> conservation of Buddhist um, arts, um, or we say artistic expression and nowadays. And her work is very much blessed by the teachers of the tradition, particularly Tibetan teachers. Um, she's been encouraged to do this work and she's made it her lifelong work. So we're very happy she's doing that. And you should check if you're interested, the caretaker, uh, treasury, treasury caretakers, what is the name? Yeah. Treasury um, caretaker training. Training, because this is very interesting um, because it's helping the monasteries themselves, the nuns and monks to take care in a very um, uh, precise and careful way of their artwork and in many ways appreciating what is around them. So welcome to both of you. I wanna welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today, both live and later in video replay. Thank you to Diane and Ranjan Yeshi Institute. Thank you to the Buddhist teachers, monastics, community members, artists, and scholars who have graciously allowed me to interview them for this research since 1970. Thank you to our treasure caretaker training team of monastic and community treasure caretakers, our board members, and paid and unpaid volunteer staff. Thank you to our funders, many individual donors. Thank you for believing in us and to our foundation and major donors, including the Pema Chodron Foundation, Kensei Foundation, Shelley and Donald Rubin Foundation, Shambhala Trust, Oracle Corporation, Henry Ming Shen, Anne Thomas Donaghy, Terence Tai, and many, many more. We thank you. I'd like to say that if anyone watching now or later is interested in any of these images, please contact me and I'd be happy to share them with you. After all, part of my professional work as an art conservator is consultation for museums and private collectors on their tangible sacred art collections. I'm called in to work closely with staff of museums for conservation examination and to document and design treatments and preservation parameters for texts, tankas, all Buddhist art collections. Of course, I love working in monasteries and have done so since 1970. In monasteries, we work together on preservation of texts, tankas, and everything else that a monastery or a nunnery values. Preservation of historical treasures in monasteries and communities depends on knowledge and disaster preparedness. It depends on the caretakers themselves within the monasteries, not on external efforts. Risks and hazards are taught in museums as a model for heritage preservation, but it's mostly theoretical. However, in monasteries and communities, almost every risk and hazard is a daily occurrence. 
many of you may already know about the material I am presenting today. For further preservation information, however, please access our Preservation of Buddhist Treasures resource. We invite you to our new website designed by Martin Street Media. All this information is free and online at treasuresresource.com. Within a monastery, traditional texts are given a place of honor. Here in this monastery, you can see texts, statues, tankas, chevrons, etc. For this Zoom, many of you joining here visit monasteries often, or in fact, you live in monasteries. And there are also people watching who have never visited a monastery and are just now learning about Buddhism. It's very interesting that texts are actively being digitized. There's a huge amount of funding for digitizing Buddhist texts, with good reason. The originals are suffering in permanence or enduring in permanence. Texts in monasteries are usually inventoried. However, it's quite interesting. Everyone knows where a certain text is, but it's worth noting that tankas are usually not inventoried. This statue of Manjushri shows the importance of text. The text is located on his lotus. Texts are so important in Buddhist iconography. The actual relationship between texts and tankas is one that's so intimate that we often forget that these iconographic depictions served as a guide to meditation and visualization for those through the centuries who did not know how to read, as well as serving as a guide to meditation and visualization to those who are scholars of the texts. The historical figure in this painting is holding a traditional text. There's a strong and direct relationship between traditional Buddhist texts and most forms of Buddhist tangible and intangible artistic expression. Tangible means such things as tankas and statues. Intangible means like chanting and dances. These are texts in a box. Beautiful painting, isn't it? Let's quickly review the tanka form. A tanka is a Buddhist religious object in the form of a scroll. It's very complex in construction. It has a painting, a textile mounting, sometimes leather corners, pendant ribbons, textile cover, a cord to hold up the tanka, a cord or ribbons from which to hang the tanka to raise the cover, top and bottom dowels, wooden or metal decorative knobs on the bottom dowel, and also it's iconographically complex, the complete tanka form consists of a painting and a mounting. As a conservator, I consider the traditional tanka to be more of a sculptural, sculptural form than just a painting. Mm -hmm. Tankas evolved from the long history of scroll paintings and from the nomadic lifestyle of early Buddhist monasteries. These monks traveled extensively to outlying areas to spread the teachings of Buddha. Everything they needed and used travel on the backs of the ox, including texts, tents, furnitures, tankas, robes, food, everything. As illustrated in this tanka detail, a gar tent. Although I've researched and published widely on the Tonka form, I work in monasteries and communities for the preservation of all types of treasures. For example, these masks and costumes are tangible art forms used in the performance of dance. This is based on iconography that is lifted off the page of traditional texts. In fact, 
the dance and costumes brings the text alive for many people. Both texts and tankas are worthy of and are shown respect. <clears throat> the conjure texts especially are considered the words of the Buddha. Here the conjure text is carried respectfully in a yearly procession. This very traditional caretaker in a monastery is deeply respectful of his tankas. He's covering his face so as not to breathe on the most sacred tankas in his monastery. However, of course, from a conservation point of view, the rolling and unrolling has created physical damage, as well as the tankas being stored on top of each other's kind of crushing the painting. The tanka form is not separate from the world of texts. They work closely together. Most tanka iconography that you see comes from texts. However, there is the rare form of tanka where a master, meditation master, who's also a master painter, has a term of visualization and then he paints that. And it's a unique painting, a unique tanka that usually does not come from a text, it comes from realization. This is, for example, the eighth come to a and one of his terama tankas. Also, Many traditional texts actually have images of deities printed or sometimes elaborately painted. I love this picture. A nun friend just sent it to me this morning. You could see that her favorite text has been eaten by insects in India. Yes, there are drawings and paintings on texts. And there's also text on tanka paintings. For example, another meditation master who's also a master painter, Karmapa 17, His Holiness, has both image and text in this painting of his. Many tangas have text and plenty of it on the front, on the back, including the blessing syllables, but often long sections of text from the pages. Through the science of light, we can make visible elements of text and iconography that have been damaged without harming the original tanka. We use different light sources and I'm able to recover almost all of the lost writing without harming the original. For example, if there's gold that has disappeared, has become indistinct, it's possible to make it visible again. This is enhanced lighting. Directly from the text, here's the translation. For example, the single pristine knowledge of the primordial itself dawns intensively like an optical illusion and the residents and the residents who reside there thus in this mandala, may the protectors who abide in the word of the Buddha together with their servants, etc. This is directly from the text and you find it on the Tanka. Here's an example of gold that has become indistinct, which our use of lighting apps has brought to vision. And I have to tell you, our translator friends really love this. They appreciate it. After all, if you say that the function of a tanka is to communicate teachings, then texts are disseminated through the tanka form as they have been through the centuries and still are now. For example, recently, Dodripshin Rinpoche engaged a painting master to illustrate a lengthy Buddhist text. He knew that his students were too busy to read the traditional text, and most of them actually didn't read Tibetan, but that many of his students would see the Tanka series illustrating the text, most likely in digital form on their computers. They would love the paintings. These are the paintings illustrating the text which had not been illustrated before. And then he talked from it using the paintings. Mm -hmm. 
Because the Rinpoche is elderly, the artist wanted to include him in the Tonka series so that in the future, when he passes away, generations will know what he looked like. He's actually very humble and dresses simply, but the artist took license to make the robes fancier. He depicted him without his eyeglasses and he's wearing a lot of brocade, which he usually doesn't. This is how he will be viewed in the future. Now we're talking about the evolution of form in both texts and tankas. As with texts, copying is within the tradition. According to available materials and current cultural influence, the appearance of tankas changes. First in these images, you see a traditional woodblock print of the third Karmapa Ranjun Dorje, his face appearing in a full moon. The woodblock print is traditional and widely distributed. The wall painting from the print is on a monastery wall. I've been documenting it for years to see how it's aging on the monastery wall. And the newly painted tanka was copied from the wall painting and will be sold as digital prints. In fact, time moves on. Handwritten and hand printed books have changed in form to first machine printed and now can be digitally scanned and accessed. This means that sacred texts can now have a wider audience especially if you have the original and then translation on the same page. This is similar to the wider audience that Tankas now have when shared as digital resource. The question of empowerment for Tankas and texts is often asked, especially with changes in the form. These questions about empowerment and texts, Acharya will certainly answer for you next. For example, is the text itself sacred or are the contents sacred? In the 21st century, everything is digitized. So what is the status of a digital version of a sutra? Is the digital version sacred when it's up on the website? Or does it become sacred once it's printed or during meditation practice. Please allow me to introduce Acharya Chuyang Gurme, who is an expert on Buddhist history and philosophy. This picture was taken in my office in Halifax, where he was a guest. Thanks so much for your time. I do look forward to your questions. And now I pass it on to Acharya. First of all, thank you very much for Anne Chateau and the Dine inviting me here to talk. Let me start with the uh, uh, 
Tanka, let's say, no, let's say not the Tanka first. First, let's say how the painting come into the Buddhist teaching. First, we will talk about this. So the Tanka, the second point, Tanka, the tradition is came from Tibet in the, our Vajrayana practice or the Mayana practice. But the painting came into the Buddhist teaching is not from Tibet. It's from India and is from Buddha himself. So let me explain how it came. So when there was a Buddha, so I think we don't have much time, so I will go uh, concisely. So when there was a Buddha, we used to say the place name called Magadha. Magadha. Nowadays, you can understand as a Bodh Gaya. Just simple way, okay? So king of Magadha is called Bimbisara. King Bimbisara is the student of Buddha. And he has a one friend, the king Utayana. His name is Utayana. So there's the two king, Bimbisara and the Utayana. So they, how to say, oftenly or the most of the time on the occasion time, they give each other as a gift, very precious gift. They're king, right? So they gave each other very precious gift. So one time, the, the King Utayana gave uh, to the Bimbisara, very precious gift. Then the King Bimbisara doesn't know that according to that precious gift, what to return back as a gift. Then he was a student of Buddha, the King Bimbisara. Then he went to see Buddha and asked the King Utayana, my friend gave me this precious gift. Now I'm lost what to give and I don't have idea what to uh, give back to him as a gift. Then Buddha said, Actually, I want to show the picture how it looks like the will of and uh, the will of we sometimes we say will of samsara and sometimes we say will of life. So the king Bimbisara went to Buddha and asked uh, what to present back because I cannot compare according to his precious and value of his gift. Then Buddha guide him to draw the will of life or will of samsara. So then, then give back it to the King Utayana. So then King Bimbisara brought so many great artists near to the Buddha because King Bimbisara doesn't know King Bimbisara doesn't know how to uh, guide or how to design the picture of picture or the, the draw, the will of life or the will of samsara. So King Bimbisara brought so many great artists to the Buddha then. Buddha himself guide or design the will of, uh, will of life or will of samsara. Then that, that time, the, the artist cannot uh, contact eye contact or they cannot see direct to the Buddha because of his power and his energy, you know. Then inside the wheel of samsara, small Buddhas paint also there, Buddhas draw also there. So they did the draw, they copy from Buddha's shadow. They look at the Buddha's shadow and they did the Buddha's pain because they cannot 
face direct to the Buddha. So that way they complete and that painting give it to the King Utayana. And after all, the Buddha himself gave advice that this painting should be on the wall of all the monastery. So nowadays, wherever you go, you will see the will of samsara or will of life, all this picture on the close to the door, the, you know, the, the will of samsara or the, the will of mm, life, you will see there. So this one, give it to the King Utayana as a written gift. Yeah, anyway, so gave it to Utayana and, and then the Buddha himself gave us the idea to put it closer to the each and every monastery's door. So nowadays, if you visit a monastery, you will see there. So this is the how it uh, came out, the painting towards Buddha's teaching. And how it related with the teaching, I will tell you now. Yeah, this one. So this is the pain Buddha himself designed and guided to draw the, the arts. So to King Bimbisara wants to return back as a gift to his friend, the King Utayana. So Buddha guide to draw this, this art, this pain. So he guide himself and which I was talking, the painter, the King Bimbisar bring the, all the printer, but, but this you see here the, on the top of the, this painting, there's a Buddha's uh, images there pointing on the, according to your screen, the, according to you, your right side. So that one, yeah. So that one, they when they draw, so they cannot see direct to the Buddha, to the painters. So they copy from Buddha's shadow. So this is the painting. But as I mentioned, guided by Buddha and drawn by some great artists, which is belong to the King Bimbisara, is this one and give it to the King Udayana. And nowadays you can see every monastery's uh, wall closer to the door, outside, not inside, outside, okay? But now I, I'm coming back to the this text and the tanka or teaching and the painted, how it related. So that time Buddha used to teach for noble truth. So according to this paint also, Buddha is showing or teaching for noble truths to the all beings. So it's like a four noble truths. As we can see in the middle, there's a three uh, how to say, birds, snake, and the peak. So this one is the, from the four noble truths, the causes of the noble truth of causes of suffering is the first one in the middle. So we can say the three poison also, but represent desire, snake represent anger, then peak represent Ignorance. So these three we used to say three poisons. Then the second row, you can see half is white and half is black. So that means if you do negative karma, you will go down. The black one facing down, you see. Then white one is going up. If you do good <laughs> karma and positive, thing, you will go up. Then that, then second round, the big one, it has a uh, six realm. 
in our culture we used to say 6 am like uh, god demi god then human then uh, animal then peta then hell hungry ghost and the uh, hell so this six this six so this six we call the samsara so whatever we do whatever we accumulated the bad karma so it will bring back to this samsara will of samsara so in this samsara wherever you born so you can have a permanent happiness but you cannot have a ultimate happiness so it it that's why we used to say the will of life or will of samsara so last row will teach you how we reborn in the samsara due to our negative karma then second third that way we we coming back to samsara so what is the cause the causes of suffering one truth and second is suffering of truth is second truth and third is the truth of path is the last one you see on the the red uh, painted there is a text it represent a uh, buddha's teaching or the path of truth path of truth, truth from the third noble truth then buddha himself is showing the moon fingering the moon that means if you practice if you follow the the path of noble truth then you can achieve as a ultimate happiness or ultimate enlightenment as a moon so that's why it shows four noble truth so now you can understand the the buddha's teaching for noble truth and how it related with this painting so this is the first paint uh, came into the came into buddhism or came into buddhist related with the teaching so then after that started uh, and it went into the different country then as like uh, when the buddha's teaching went to the tibet then they have a uh, different artists different culture different tradition so then it comes as a nowadays which we call thangka so this is the way how we we came back to thangka now now we came back to thangka okay so this is the way how we are here with thangka so started from this draw on this pen so this is the how we came with the teaching of buddha with the pain with buddha so this way we found it then now we go back to thangka so thangka itself the it has a, according to tibetan culture and tradition it's a different form or different looks so as i mentioned you whether the teaching whether the whatever it goes to the another country then it it changed the shape you know when it goes to the different culture and tradition according to their culture and tradition as like uh, when i go when i went to montreal so as like uh, according to food according to lifestyle i wear this dress but i have to change as a language you know then changing as a food so that's why when we follow flow to other country so it changes so same here with here we change with the painting so it went to the tibet and it changed little bit outer design and the you know brocade and the knots everything the cover you know but how then let's say what is tanka actually tanga means 
nowadays we can understand as a tanga means which is related to the the, the vajrayana the, the tibetan let's say tibetan buddhism so the painting of the deities which is related to the tibetan buddhism but actually before it's not like that tanka means which is painted on the cotton or the clothes if i explain directly in simple way it's like that painted on cloth or painted on cotton is called tanga mm -hmm. but it came into the religion religious why it wise it came into the buddhism or the tibetan buddhism the vajrayana then uh, it has a different shape different color different brocade as like uh, you saw already the and shuttle will show you how it looks like so this is the thing but let's say but how it is stuck in tibetan tibet but it doesn't have a clear history clear history it doesn't have as like uh, i think uh somehow is the culture or the way of painting in china it it came into the tibet people used to say but it doesn't have a clear history the when uh, king king songsen gampo married with chinese lady so that time we used to say 10 different arts arts form bring it into the uh, tibet as a master copy so from there it is start to uh, do a tanga painting in tibet one point they used to say but in the tibet in tibet that time it doesn't go when as a uh, famous then the it i think songsen gambo is like 6th uh, century or something like that then his time his time uh, it doesn't went like uh, famous and popular tanga painting but the the next king like uh, king tisung deuchen king tisung deuchen is the main king who brought the main uh, tantrayana tantrayana vajrayana bring it into the tibet from india so he is the main king his time there is a one monastery he built let's say first monastery in tibet samye we call samye monastery so that monastery is the first monastery in tibet and that when he doing the ceremony opening ceremony so he did a very big three tanga the painted on the cloth or the cotton big big very huge three tanga so from there from from then tanga when very famous and that culture or the tradition let's say when viral or they started in tibet and from there so until today we serve it as a tanga and is nowadays is very uh, the tanga painting is very famous but it has a different uh, way to paint you know there's a different way to paint and different way to use the cloth different way to use the outer brocade but that's not important today according to today's topic but i just letting you know there's uh, so many different kind but i just tell you that how it start in our buddhism in our buddhism how start the use the painting in our culture and how that form change into the tibet so it's like that that way it came into the our 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 buddhism now so tanga as n chapter explain but i'm just making clear so tang 
why we use tanga when we do practice or meditation and how we use that's very important so now tanga is in our buddhism how it came how it changed the shape now i'm going to tell you how we use in the practice mm. so as like a some according to that time many people cannot read as like a 6th century 7th century 8th century most of them are not educated people right nowadays everyone can read whether tibetan whether english whether nepali so and so forth but even if you want to practice buddhism almost every language has a book you can go through that and you can read it but still tanga and the painting are very important like uh, if you haven't seen buddha or the some master then if i say that you meditate on buddha and visualize buddha then <laughs> seriously to be frank is blind right how to visualize <laughs> if, if let's say someone's father we have to meditate or someone's mother we have to meditate or the practice through the visualization then if we didn't see how we we cannot get clear we can try imagination but but we cannot get the real test of the visualization so that's why we use painting according to the practice so whether you can read it or not doesn't matter so even if you can read but it's still as like uh, the deity's hand is putting like this he is sitting like this the text will explain you in the text but still when you can when you didn't see the picture then it's still a bit difficult to get visualization or clear clear visualization that's why we use the tanka or the nowadays before we have to use the tanka or the painting but nowadays we have option we can use picture we can use digital we can use copy we can so many things nowadays but we cannot say that are not good we cannot say that everything is good unless you know how to manage and how to use so you can use digital one as like you can open your computer and put it buddha's picture and you just try to visualize him so it will do right and if you don't have computer then you put it tanka and if you don't have a good financial then you just make it copy then very simple right now this go to google and just just make it photocopy of buddha's picture then just put it into in front of your desk and you just visualize so it does so that way we can use our tanka or the painting or the digital copy or image whatever but before we don't have option so so as as ancestors show you the one rinpoche's picture with the painting the the painter change his dress off so that way uh, master himself guide to the painter or the 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 who is going to painting him so he will let him do this and that which is uh, helpful and which will be the meaningful so he will guide, guide him to draw like that and this so that way it came so this is the tanka how important in our practice is that whether you can read the text or whether you cannot read the text but according to our the tantrayana or the vajrayana we we have to practice most of the practice we have to do visualization as like a just simple one like we used to do short guru yoga so sitting yourself like this then in in front of your space sitting on the moon and lotus 
seat your guru and all the 10 direction buddha and bodhisattva was present in him we used to say this like this and we have to visualize so if we saw something painting or the photo or the image whatever then it's a bit easy to imagine that visualize everyone is present there but if it is blind then if lama or the teacher is guiding you you do this and that but we can try but it, it will be a bit difficult so that way according to our vajrayana we have so many deities wrathful deities peaceful deities then so many lineage lamas like uh, we have a uh, four different lineage major four different lineage like keluk sacha nimma kaju so it has a different protector different deities di different lamas then we cannot visualize so through that through tanga through photo through image we can bring our clear visualization so that's why tanga is very important in our the vajrayana practice so that way we use so this is the short explanation of tanga and the text how it related so let's open the questions for acharya gyome yes ray yeah yeah sure yes my my question is for is for you both acharya and uh, the the conservator sorry sorry i have i have hard time to remember names sorry <laughs> sorry for you um uh my question is the the following nowadays when when we have the chance to travel or or, or even if we don't travel we can find the uh, tankas uh, anywhere now there's a there's a shop in the uh, downtown montreal i don't know if it still exists but chinese used to sell there uh, so absolutely beautiful tankas and uh and they have become pieces of art that people hang anywhere they they they're not necessarily for uh, for devotion or i'm not sure that most of the tankas that those trekkers who, who who travel in nepal and buy in tamil or in boda brings it back as a, as a devote uh, devotion piece of art that, that to which they will devote something it's mostly like a it's mostly mostly like a trophy that people bring back and hang on their wall anywhere actually i even saw tankas in in toilets sometimes and and i'd like to 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 know what <laughs> what you think of it what you acharya and 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 what you from from your uh, your heart of uh, conserving uh, conserving the 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 tankas uh, think about this uh, this transformation into uh, into the modern life into into a piece of art that we just hang on the wall to decorate our uh, surrounding yeah yeah so nowadays people treat tanga as a decorated how to say object for the decoration mm -hmm. but i think if i am not wrong a uh, buddhist practitioner doesn't do that mm -hmm. the when the buddhist practitioner buy tanga and take it to the home i'm sure that they will take it care carefully and they mm -hmm. protect very carefully and even if they hang it on the hall wall they will do at altar room or the shrine hall so according to the buddhist uh, practitioner we have a special room for the uh, our practice or the we call altar or the shrine room so we hang it inside the that room so that's why i don't think buddhist people do treat like uh, the object for the decoration but yes i agree with you most of the people they go to nepal somewhere somewhere then they see very beautiful then they buy and they put it on the wall wherever wherever at their home as you mentioned in, even in the toilet also so i think maybe the lack of uh the reason and the lack of the tanga's purpose what is the purpose of tanga and what it represent so lack of that knowledge i think so they use as a decoration object so uh, 
uh, I will say it's not a good idea. So if you, mm. even not Buddhist, then you can use at your as a decoration, but I don't think it's proper in the using in the toilet. But even sitting room or bedroom, it's okay, I think. Yeah, but well, well, I think that it I becomes chance, Jesus an inspiration. I, it's yeah. become inspiration for people wherever they put it. Yeah. yeah. So if I have a chance to talk with like that people, then I will request them not to hang in the toilet and all, not to <laughs> do disrespect, you know. They can keep no, no, sure. uh, respectfully. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. Anne, would you like to add something? Please, Anne. As a conservator, of course, I care about the condition of it, where it's hung. But uh, for years, I've been interviewing te great teachers about how they felt just about that question. And of course, Acharya has given the perfect answer. Mm -hmm. I'd like to give a quote from when I first asked this question years, decades ago to Trunga Rinpoche, and it made him sad, but in a positive sense, he said that hopefully in some level they'd be inspired and um, they would uh, benefit from the seed of merit being planted just by viewing these images, no matter where, no matter how. Mm. Beautiful. Thank mm. you, Anne. Is there another Thanks a lot. question? Would, uh, yeah. would you lift your hand? Yes, Peter? So uh, from your explanation, uh, <clears throat> I kind of uh, appreciate and, and a sense of guilt somewhat to the uh, using as decoration, uh, the most beautiful, precious tankas that I've ever seen from my teacher. Um, I, uh, from your explanation, I see it almost like a do-it-yourself manual. So this is a how to do a practice without the text. And there is a uh, limit to um, a novice knowing how to do a practice, but having a complete uh, image of the practice means that I, uh, uh, to some extent, have support. I thought that if there was a tanka on how to share your screen, Acharya, in a Zoom call, you know, you could have looked at the uh, at the instruction tanka on how to share your screen, and then you would have everybody would have been able to enjoy the image and the teaching you are offering, right? So, so in a way, I see it in this uh, do-it-yourself way. So there's a there's and then there's a, uh, a level in Vajrayana of not necessarily understanding the expanse of the teaching and needing so much support just to just to engage what like what's the power of the visualization or whatever and then lastly i just wanted to mention that i asked my teacher uh, what i should do with the tankas when i uh, die and uh, uh, he is not all that happy with me, I have to say, that I have these tankas that I'm not doing all the practices. But nonetheless, um, I have bought them to support him and uh, veneration. He told me that if when I die, I either pass them on or I should cremate them because they're no different than the Buddha himself. So... So, you know, I have a sense of being in the presence of the Buddha. <laughs> because mm -hmm. I uh, trust Lama Sundra that he would not have said it if it wasn't completely true. Yes. Learning how to do, learning how to use the manual is mm -hmm. a critical part. It's almost, uh, the, other, the other piece of it is thinking of Marpa the translator the image mm. can go and then can be translated <laughs> into yes. language. So the image can be in 
in the Yale Art Museum, and we may have a visitor who will ask a question that will lead to some uh, illumination of the teachings. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's very, uh, it's complex, and I'm nowhere near smart enough to understand it. Um, there is always a possibility <laughs> of just supplicating the teacher and asking for the teachings, regardless of how impractical it is to do it on my meditation cushion. I have found that to work extremely well when I've trusted the process. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any comments on that, Acharya? Gilray? Yeah, yeah. I, as, as I mentioned that we should not use as a decoration and we should not use in the place on the misplace as like a disrespectful as I mentioned. Then, yes, I mentioned you, we are using for the practice, visualization and the meditation. I already explained you. Even I can uh, tell you one more thing. As like a tanka, I forgot to explain that one, okay? So as I mentioned, mostly, we use for the visualization. But the second point, we use as an object to take refuge and the take offering also. Like uh, we keep Buddha's statue, then we do prostration, we do offering, we do take refuge from that statue. So we can use same object tanga also as a statue, we can use same as a tanga also. So you can put it in front of your place, then you can prostrate. Imagine that the deity or the Buddha is present there, then you can do prostration, you can do offering, and you can do take refuge also. So there's a different, there's a so many different way to use the tanga. But, but if the non-Buddhists, if they are using as a decoration, then we, we can't do anything. So what I was telling that. So being as a Buddhist or being as a practitioner, we cannot use like that way. So we can use as a refuge object or as a object for the clear visualization. That way we can use. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nama Gyomi. I'm thinking of, um, of a discussion I've had in class with some students and particularly Birat Brahmacharya who is a Newar um, Brahmacharya. And he was saying that um, with the uh, 8,000 line Pragna Paramita Sutra, mm -hmm. they, um, they actually think of the text as a living being. So they offer food, like if it was the embodiment of Buddha or mm -hmm. the wisdom of the Buddha, they give food and yeah, they yeah. worship as if it was the Buddha. And it's a similar thing that you're talking about with the Tanka, as if it's a living being that we offer water, we offer flowers, mm. we offer. And so the, it's more about the presence of wisdom, the embodiment mm. of wisdom, than the actual mm. image itself, right? There is a sense of presence yeah, yeah. that is there. And it, yeah, it yeah. really links with the, the theme of this uh, whole sec section, the guest lecture, about the idea yes. of, of embodying this wisdom through visual, through dance, through all kinds yes. of ways so that we sense the power of the wisdom as if it was mm. present. And it is yes. present, but we forget that yes. it's present, right? That yes. kind of thing, isn't it? Yes, yes, you're okay. right. Can, yes, can I say we forget something? that, and when we see tanga and when we see the pictures, then it reminds us that they are present there. So that that is the way we are using. And thank you, yeah, thank you. Me, There is a, you. a comment coming from the floor. Who was uh, wanting to add? Yeah, um, Rochelle. I I wanted to say something. Hi. 
Um, mm -hmm. I'm Rochelle from New York City. I'm a Dharma practitioner. But I went to a friend's house. She just recently got married. And her husband had a beautiful framed uh, tanka that he said. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, I looked at it and uh, he said, well, I found this tanka in a shop and I bought it because I really liked it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it protects me. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. So when I looked at it, I realized it was Avalokiteshvara. <laughs> mm -hmm. So That's good. I knew who it was. And then I explained to him what the tanka was. And he said, oh, okay, mm -hmm. yeah, I really like it. But then like uh, years later, um, I mean, every time I passed the tanka, I would stop and look at it and bow. Yeah, uh, that's the reason uh, why we yeah. are using tanka. <laughs> <laughs> so I would bow and I would say mantras and, you know, maybe ask for something or, because to me it was like a precious, it was Avalokiteshvara. Mm -hmm. So uh, years later, he got very sick and he had to have open heart surgery. Mm -hmm. And so I was like doing practices for him and I asked the Tonka, I mean, I wasn't at his house, but I mm -hmm. asked the Tonka to please help him get well. So mm -hmm. because that Avalokiteshvara had a connection and he had a connection to Avalokiteshvara, though he's not a practitioner, I really feel that that Tonka took care of him because he recovered and he was just totally fine. And it was like an amazing, mm -hmm. you know, like a heart surgery. So mm -hmm. sometimes... You know, like the tanka is is a blessing, and uh, whoever finds it or puts it in his house, it is like a um, good luck. Let's say it's very lucky yes. that they even have a tanka in their house. And to me, that could represent a connection to the dharma that they don't even know they had from you know whatever. Mm. But it's it's a sacred thing to even have a tanka in the house, like a very lucky thing to connect to the Buddhist teaching. So I don't think it's such a bad thing. And then once uh, a friend of ours did a t-shirts, he made the, the Buddhist, the medicine Buddha on a t-shirt. And we were practicing with Kempo Tsultrim Gyamso Rinpoche. And uh, we asked him about it. And he said, well, it's okay to have a medicine Buddha tanka on your, you know, the image on a t-shirt, but just don't put the t-shirt on the floor. Yeah. So that, that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your Thank you. comment. Thank you. But according to her talk, I will add a few words. As she mentioned, she can connect with tanka. But whenever you practice and visualize uh, towards tanka, towards statue, towards painting, towards photo. But what I will like to request you is that don't think that is a statue, that is tanka, that is just, just a paper, form of paper, you know. When you are trying to connect with where the tanga can be any image, right? Like uh, can be Buddha, can be Guru Ramboche, can be different deities. But whatever deities you're facing or the practicing through that image or the tanga, so you have to visualize or you have to imagine that they are present with the, the we used to say ultimate form clear, empty, you know, not like a flesh and blood like us. So unity of clear, clear and the empty. So like that. So you have to practice like that and you have to connect that way. Then that will help, help you to connect with your true nature of mind. So that's the different one way to connect, you know, but Tanka help us or the statue or the photo will help us how to connect with the true nature of mind. 
So this this way you have to use. Otherwise, if you think that this is the kind of paper, kind of statue, kind of tanga, then according to our practice, it's it's quite tough to get blessing. As like uh, our uh, Buddhist practice lineage or the the chain is very important. So it's if you think like that, then it's a bit difficult to get blessing from that or the bit difficult to connect with that. So if you do clear and empty unity of that, then it's quite easy to connect with your true nature of mind. So, so you can try it that way, that way in the future. Great, thank you, thank you. This is very inspiring, actually. Um, is there any uh, one last questions from the floor? Or Anne, do you want to add something? Yeah, Ray, Ray, Tendu, Ray Tendu want to say something. Yes, Ray? Yes, just just quickly. I, I, I got a... a, a, a I met with an astrologer of the His Holiness Dalai Lama many years ago, and he told me to uh, he told me to bring an image of uh, Namgyalma in my house. And mm. at that moment, I didn't know what to do with that because I don't know Namgyalma. I, I've never seen Namgyalma. Uh, mm. I've never practiced uh, this deity. Um, and I brought a beautiful tanka. I went to see a friend who's a tanka painter in uh, in uh, Kathmandu, and I asked him. His father made me a, a wonderful namgyalma that I brought back home. It's on my wall, and and I can confirm something that you just said is that that to me in my little gompa, this is a precious treasure that I have there. I, I, I really respect this namgyalma, mm -hmm. but. Every day when I do the offering, when I come with the incense and when I come with the light, I dedicate it also to Namgyama. But I, the only connection I feel with Namgyama there is that I have been told that I should have Namgyama in my house, that it would protect mm. my life and my health and everything. Mm. And, and, uh, and I trusted it because it came from, from an astrologer from His Holiness uh, Dalai Lama's uh, Institute. But, but, but yeah, how, how can... How can one connect with, with the Tanka actually when there is not so much connection, but someone who think that you should have it at home and then you 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 answer by yes, okay, I will, and then then it's in my gompa. <laughs> How can I connect yes. with it? The the you mean that how can you connect with that? Yes, 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 that's the right. question, yeah. <laughs> So according to the, according to Buddhist or Buddhism, the connection is very important. We used to say karmic connection, mm -hmm. karmic connection. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's like a very, very famous and popular teacher come to you and teach you, but whatever you, he or she talk, you still you're blind. But some teacher, they doesn't know anything, just uh, common people. But when they guide you, you get very clear, like uh, Buddha is giving instruction to you. So th that means you both have very good karmic connection. Mm. So that way now the Namjalma Tanga is in your house or in your gomba. Then now already you realize that that is Namjalma. So you have to bring your devotion to respect, pristine respect and devotion day by day. Then it will increase. Then one day you can feel the connection with Namjalma. Otherwise, it's like we go to Gomba and see, oh, Namjalma Tanga is there. But you're not trying to bring your devotion, respect towards Namjalma, faith, trust, everything. Right, then second day also you will see, oh, Namjalma is there. Even as like, uh, just let's say, when you are going to home, you may see someone there every day. But until, unless if you're not trying to connect with him, you don't get, mm -hmm. oh, someone is there. Tomorrow also someone is there. If you introduce yourself and if you try to talk to him, if you, 
try to understand him then he will talk to you then you make know each other you make him uh, get a good friend you know so that way we have to connect our connection we have to make it connection so same now tanga is in your home or your gomba so you have to you have to see and you have to realize you have to bring your devotion you have to bring your pristine respect you have to bring your faith on her then then slowly slowly you will realize or you can feel the connection so that way we have to improve that's beautiful what you say i think i think i'm already yeah. doing some offering i'm i'm coming to i, I consider namgyalma as, as my guest my important guest in the place yeah that's but it's that's it's, it's it's as if it's as if i was told well invite that person because she she's a, an important person and i'm very happy to have her in my in my gompa but i don't know her at all who's important she has what does she bring me what what, she, what kind of relation i have with her i i don't really know but of course when i come to always namgyalma every morning i do my offering bowls and then i for incense and I I lit candles everywhere in the gompa and it's important she is there I, I bow to her every time but that's my my only little interaction with her and sometimes it feels like well I have an invited guest that I don't know <laughs> yeah yeah but mm. as i mentioned you have to improve your devotion towards them then second point what you have to think is that you have a important guest in your home as a deity mm. namjalma then she is the only one who can help you or who can take you to the enlightenment so you have to see this way you have a very important guidance guide or you have to see him as a protector so because we want to attain enlightenment for sake of ourselves or for sake of all sentient beings so without without their help without their hand it is it is not so possible so we have to every day you have to take devotion every day you have to take refuge every day you have to ask or the you have to take a inspiration how they did and i will follow their step and i will do same as them so this is the dim, different way to take a devotion otherwise as like uh, always we go to temple just oh i please bless us to fulfill my business fulfill my uh, so and so forth you know <laughs> so this this is not the perfect way to do a prayer and the and the supplication so according to buddhist what we have to do is that when we are taking refuge to the buddha then we have to see him as an inspiration also how he did for the enlightenment why he try to attain enlightenment so for sake of all sentient beings right so we have to take a inspiration and we have to do every day like a every day refuge every day bodhicitta you know so i'm going to practice as much as i can to benefit all sentient beings that purpose i have to get enlightenment so that have to uh, that's why i have to practice so that way so that way you have to see namjalma and take her as a your guidance take her as a your protector take her as a your refuge object then then one day you will feel the connection with her should 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 actually the 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 sadhana be known to to or or transmitted to be practiced because i have a text of of the namgyalma sadhana but i never touch it because i felt well it's not been translated to me not translated but it's not been transmitted to me and and i just i was just curious to know the sadhana of, of namgyalma so this connection with 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 the, with this uh, support that is this famous wonderful tanka could come through a practice but if it's not a practice that has been given or transmitted by someone i i feel afraid that that's probably my shame uh, to 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 connect more with the with a practice that i don't know i don't know. maybe i don't know mm. anyway i don't want to spend much time on it but uh, yeah, thanks is, you um, have answered a lot thank you there is one more question um the first of the last <laughs> uh, is for ann um And Fedora, would you like to ask your question to Anne? 
Uh, sure. So um, in terms of conserving uh, the tank heads, how do you balance their uh, sacred usage and significance with their need for conservation treatment? Thank you so much for that question. I think according to everything that in the excellent explanation that Acharya has given, that these are just not works of art. And so uh, in terms of conservation, I really prefer to approach it from stabilizing the condition so that tankas can continue to be used for their purpose uh, instead of using um, an overlay of Western uh, aesthetics that paintings have to be perfect and therefore we should overclean and overpaint historic tankas, removing all evidence of respectful use. That's not really what I would suggest at all. I truly believe that if there's a small tear or something like that, it could be stabilized, but no aesthetic integration or cleaning tankas. Um, and on the conservation spectrum, when you're a conservator, uh, it's best just to stabilize and not aesthetically restore to the point of uh, some ideal of perfection because traditionally tankas were copied as we discussed. So to continue on the sharing of the iconography, a tanka painter would be called in to copy a historic tanka, create a new one to continue the sharing of the image. Uh, traditionally, historic tankas were not received restoration treatment at all. So I do appreciate your question. I think respecting their sacred nature also means not to treat them as uh, museum objects and just to respect them as object, sacred objects in use and only assist in the continuance of the use through very, very minor mends. So again, stabilizing. Very good question, thank you. Thank you, and this is very interesting, and it relates to the idea of using all the skills that we learn in kind of the Western approach and Western science and, and kind of knowledge that has been developed, but having a different relationship to the object. It's kind of like including wisdom into it rather than just staying on the surface level. It's kind of like... Mm broadening our views this is very interesting it kind of really brings the this 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 um profound intimate knowledge with um um skills really huh? technical skills but with a different approach thank you and that was wonderful and i think that it would be really interesting to um to develop that in in museums and so on um, I'm going to uh, kind of close the conversation, even though I think this is really exciting um, to bring these two views and these two uh, ways of approaching uh, tankas and artistic expression. But um, I'm concerned with one uh, student uh, of mine who is doing a, um, a master's degree and thesis on the notion of connection because it seems so permeating the whole Buddhist spectrum of discussion. So having a, a connection with a teacher, having a connection with a text, having a connection with the tankas, having a connection with a sangha. And it seems to be like the Buddhist path <laughs> seems to be about connection. And I wondered if uh, two things, if you could just say a few words because we're getting to the end but if you would also accept to be interviewed by her, if you um, uh, wanted, Lama Guillaume. You mean, you want me to talk about connection? Yeah, that notion, why, where, what, what is that? Why is it so permeating Buddhist thought? Making a connection with, uh, with the Tanka, with the deity. It's almost like getting to know a real person, but it has to do with making a connection. Yeah, it's it's very important to uh, know Thangka statue and 
all this thing, all the objects, how to use, as I mentioned. But I already said that how to uh, connect with all these objects. So according to the connection is very important in our religion or the Buddhist, especially in the Vajrayana. And, and even if simple way as like, uh, if there's a no good connection, then, then, <laughs> then everything it's difficult to understand. Like uh, if, if let's say I'm very good connection with my mother. So even if I say bad words to my mom, she, she doesn't care and she doesn't angry with me because of connection and because of love. Then she, she can realize or she can understand me very well with our good connection. But I don't mean all the mom and son, all the mom and daughter are like that, but who has a good connection, they can know or they can reach, uh, read each other very well. So same in this uh, topic, also very important as a, uh, the connection, because when you have a good connection with the statue, with the tanka or with teacher, then when they're guiding you, when they're teaching you, you can realize, you can understand, you can feel with their teaching. So that's why it's very important connection is, but how to uh, increase or how to build that connection. So as I mentioned, so first when we see the teacher, when we see the statue, when we see the tanga, when we see the text, first time, some as like a previous uh, karmic connection, we get very deep connection with that one. Some, some people but not all. But most of the time, we have to build our connection, as I mentioned. So when we see Buddha's statue, when we see Buddha's tanka, then don't treat as a painting and don't treat as a statue. So treat them as a real or ultimate Buddha and try to increase your faith, increase your devotion. So that way, so one day, two day, three day, you know, day by day, it, it will go unlimited. So that way we have to increase our uh, connection or we have to build our connection that way. I think this is the simplest way to uh, make connection with uh, Buddha or Tanka or statue. So this way we have to increase. This so is... then one day we will get the real feeling of the connection right it has to do with heart right yeah yeah it has, has to, to do, do with heart, heart. Somehow, yes, yes. how do we how do we open the heart how do we connect with the heart in in many ways it has to do with the okay, heart okay. and i mm. remember kimputsu jenjetsu rinpoche telling mm. me you cannot force connection no you can encourage it you can no. nurture it but you cannot yeah. force it. You cannot go, okay, I'm going to make a connection from completely intellectual point of view. So it has to do with heart. It has to do with sensory, sensing. Yes. You, you mentioned the word love, which is even more powerful, right? Yes, yes. Love. It's like uh, you mentioned that we cannot force. Let's say... I want to connect with you all. And if I force you with the gun or win, with the power, you may pretend, but that is not the real connection. You may pretend like, oh, you're good, so and so forth, you know. <laughs> that is the, we used to say pretending like uh, connected, but not the real connection. So that's why we have to build the connection means, so all of with you, Let's chit chat, let's try to introduce, let love each other, care each other, then compassion each other. So that way we have to build our connection. Then once you know each other, then the loving kindness and compassion, it's easy to come. 
in between us. When there is a loving kindness and compassion in between us, then it is very easy to connect each other. So this is the way to connect with, con to get connection with each other. Otherwise, <laughs> forcing power doesn't work, this connection. Because we are talking about the inner connection, not, not the body connection, not the wealth connection. We are talking about the inner connection, feeling. So, so that's why we have to bring our connection with the love and loving kindness and compassion. So what we used to say is that even most of the time, as like a, being as a Buddhist practitioner, we talk very high level, you know, I practice these deities, that deities, and uh, <laughs> this and that. But sometimes uh, we don't know where we are and we are trying to grab something which is in very high. So what I will say is don't do that. So what I will say is that just try to increase your loving kindness and compassion. So once you can increase your loving kindness and compassion, then every connection, like a connection with teaching, connection with teacher, connection with Buddha, every connection you can bring. So always, even if you are trying to connect with someone, so please try to connect with loving kindness and compassion. And even with the deities, even with the master, even with the Buddha, even with the Thangka, whatever. So try to generate your loving kindness and compassion all the time. So I'm sure that it will help you to connect with everything. Okay. <laughs> even with the human, even with the human also. <laughs> so this, yeah. The, so this is the best method, I think. So please. Even, even, even with this. Namgyama. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And thank you so that's, much. That's a great, great advice. And I would, I, I would um, kind of close in with, with, uh, with Anne, if you don't mind, um, Acharyala, um, in, in making that connection also with tanka painting as a conservator, there is also an aspect of being passionate or loving or be caring in yeah, yeah. some way with these objects that are the representation, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Yes, in conservation, there's also a lot of science. <laughs> and a lot of love. Respect. Respect. Respect, um, humility to ask questions of Buddhist teachers and my colleagues, and a lot of science. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So we will have to close here. I thank you so much, both of you, for accepting to come to our guest lecture. And um, I hope to connect again and again with you, with you both, with your work, with your teachings. And um, yeah, yeah. also all of us who are listening here, we're very thankful for your work. And hopefully we can connect again. Yeah, thank you very much for having me here. And not the least, but last, I will tell you that being as a Buddhist practitioner, so please uh, try to generate your loving kindness and compassion and always keep in your mind that <laughs> to attain enlightenment is quite far. So always keep in your mind that I will be, or I will try to be a good person, very kind person. Because uh, nowadays in this samsara, lack of kind person and lack of good person. But even be, as a Buddhist practitioner, if you cannot be a good or kind person, then you cannot be a good practitioner. If you cannot be a good practitioner, then you cannot attain enlightenment also. So that's why keep in your mind that try to be kind, compassionate, and good people, human being. If you lost humanity in your practice, then I don't think you will attain enlightenment. 
So humanity is very important. So please uh, make it and fresh it and respect each other. Then as like, a, if you can help others, please do as much as you can. If you can't help them, then please don't harm them. So this is my, my last humble request to you all. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you. Have a nice evening, yeah, a nice see you afternoon, soon. or nice morning, depending where you are in the world. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye.